Hi folks, uh, thank you very much for joining into the one of the series of the supply chain Dujo, SEM Dujo. Uh, I have Dr. Fayan with me. Uh, so I had the, I know Dr. Fayan for a long time. Uh, we are basically the, the graduate from the same university, Lancaster University Management School. Uh, we graduated from the management sciences together. We were in the our communication together. After that, uh, me and Dr. Fayan have been uh, incorporating in a lot of uh, supply chain research. I have been uh, the visiting lecture for Manchester University where Dr. Fayan teaches. He will tell you more about that. And we do a lot of collaboration in terms of supervising master thesis research. So uh, a lot of respect for uh, basically Dr. Fayan, especially his research on supply chain disruption and supply chain risk. And that's why I personally think Dr. Fayan is one of the most uh, credible uh, researchers right now. Uh, and it's, it's the right time given the COVID situation so we can hear from him. So the title today is uh, uh, Post COVID-19 Global Supply Chain. Uh, so before I ask my question, Dr. Fayan, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Dr. Mudas. Um, thank you for inviting me and it's uh, my pleasure to join you today. Um, so I am now currently an associate professor in operations and supply chain management at the Alliance Manchester Business School. I'm also the director of studies for the MSc Operations uh, Project and Supply Chain Management uh, Program, which I have if I have time at the end, I can tell you more about if people are interested. Uh, in terms of my research, um, as you mentioned, uh, risk uh, is one of my core research areas. Also, I work on the field of supply chain sustainability. And I have um, another identity, so I'm an entrepreneur as well. I've set up a few businesses um, uh, back home where I'm from in, in Bangladesh. So it's that's uh, about me in a nutshell. Yeah. Good, good. So uh, in this COVID situation, we know about supply chain risk, supply chain disruption, which could be a supply risk, for example, and, you know, supply mm -hmm. could go bankrupt. You know, there is a force measure. Uh, for example, there is, you know, earthquake. There's always, let's call it, known unknown supply chain disruptions. But this COVID situation right now, which comes in, let's call it every 100 years, right? So how you see this this supply chain disruption, right, is different from anything we know in the current research. Right. Uh, so, as as you know, like supply chains have increasingly become globalized, complex, and extended over the past uh, two, three decades. And what this has done is it has uh, had the effect of introducing more potential points of failure that companies must now uh, recognize and manage. So traditionally, supply chain industry has looked at disturbances or disruptions in terms of, as you mentioned, supply shocks. For example, if a factory goes down due to a fire or an extreme weather event. So in that moment, if you're a downstream buyer, then you have to decide how to manage and mitigate the disruption. Or it can be due to demand shocks, for example, the uh, plastic bullwhip effect, which occurs when there's an unexpected change in demand, leading to increased variation in customer orders upstream. Now, to understand how this pandemic is different, it is important to distinguish between uh, risk and uncertainty. So risk is when you can estimate the probability of the occurrence and the probability of the impact. And this works well for common supply chain disruptions like transportation breakdowns where you can use some historical data to quantify the level of risk. However, uh, uncertainty, uh, like you said, like the unknown, unknown is very different. It is a co condition in which it becomes very difficult to predict the likelihood of various future events. So most supply chain systems were designed for risk, but they were not designed for uncertainty. So for things like low probability, high impact events, most firms don't possess the capabilities to respond uh, appropriately. But this COVID disruption is completely different. It, it, it's, it's chaos. Uh, previously, if we were worried about ripple effects of supply chain disruptions, this is not even a wave, it's a tsunami. It's, it's, it's not a one-off localized event. It is a both a demand shock and a supply shock, and it is going to be protracted. Um, 
So there's a common theory that's used in technology design and studies called normal accident theory. And the premise is that, that when you build complex adaptive systems, uh, and supply chains are complex adaptive systems, it is highly likely that it will fail. So if a system has like a single point of failure, you can react to it. But if uh, two occurs by chance or one causes another one, then it cascades and the system becomes unmanageable as people can't react quickly enough. And that's why, um, despite the numerous supply chain upheavals that uh, has been inflicted in the last decades through disasters like the Japanese earthquake and the tsunami, um, uh, the Thailand floods, most companies still found themselves unprepared for this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, no, very, I think very well said. I think the, the point you just made, which, uh, which is a very good explanation you just did, based on differentiate between risk and uncertainty, right? So because we can have, we have a methods available and two, uh, two, uh, you know, tools available. For example, we do a lot of RPN, which is risk priority in the analysis. So the tools available to identify, identify the risk and you can basically grade them from highest to lowest and you can work towards mitigating the, uh, the risk, which is, uh, which is comes at the higher, uh, number based on whatever the factors of weightage you have uh, you have selected, uh, but the uncertainty it's basically this is where the problem is right. So what I recently did was uh, so I'm hearing a lot in the last three four months when the pandemic pandemic is beginning, I'm hearing a lot of questions and I've been invited into quite a few uh, let's call it webinars to speak on the same topic. Uh, so when I was in one of the webinars, uh, it, just, it was about two hours just uh, me as a keynote speaker. Uh, and the questions that people asking about generally was falling into four themes, right? The first theme was basically demand uncertainty. So that's one of the biggest problems we have right now because of the COVID. What is how the demand will look like regardless of uh, which of the industry you are in, automotive, transportation, manufacturing, airline, uh, hospitality, holiday recreation, you name it, every industry, there's a level of uncertainty is there, right? So that's the one of the key themes which was coming out. The second thing, a theme was coming out is the over-reliance on supply from China because everything was shut, right? And a lot of manufacturing, especially in the Asia Pacific and, and Europe and, and USA at the same time, uh, they are one way or the another way are dependent on say, you know supply from China, uh, be, maybe is a first tier supplier, second tier supplier. In some way, they are impacted, right? And since China was on lockdown, there was no uh, supplies coming in, and their production was affected. Even though there was a demand, they cannot just produce on time, right? So that was a second team theme coming out. Uh, again, we'll talk about more on this topic. The third theme which was coming out during the discussion was uh, the health and safety of the especially people uh, who touches the product, product, right, or move the product, i.e. people in logistics. You could be in a distribution center, you could be in the warehouse, you could be a driver, you could be into the, uh, for example, uh, last mile delivery person that you have to go out and you have to pick products, you have to deliver products in days and traction. So that was the um, uh, the theme coming out uh, as well, uh, as one of the Absolutely, yeah. points. Right. And the fourth theme which is coming out is the is the production capacity, right? Because most of the manufacturing plant, which is a uh, uh, central, uh, you know, which is vertically integrated, if they have a high capacity, high capital investment. So they're not going to run the plant. So we're going to shut down the plant. Then how do you want to manage the available capacity? So what I actually did was I took took those four themes or four problems I've been hearing, and I put a poll into my LinkedIn because you know I have a quite a bit of LinkedIn following about you know thirty three thousand people ish. So about 393 people has replied in, in three days, in fact, and 61% of the, of the, of the team, 61% uh, of the people actually mentioned demand uncertainty as one of the key themes. So out of 393, 61% was demand uncertainty. The second followed by was basically, you know, the safety protocols or safety concern for the logistics people or any or the people in supply chain in general or in business in general, which was 15%, right? So can you see the difference between the first one, which was 69% and the second one, which was basically 15%, right? Followed by supply in China and followed by uh, production capacity. So this is where I think uh, we, so there are the four things I think right now, 
uh, if you want to focus on the on the problem and uncertainty which is mentioned by dr fayan i would say just focus on the the as demand as your biggest problem how to understand that demand right so so in the first part what we try to do is to expand on the current problem we are facing so as there is a famous saying goes right when there when you understand the problem problem is half solved right so i'm not trying to focus on there's a lot of chatter there's a lot of noise of the supply chain disruption supply chain risk covid situation what's going to happen my mind the way my mind was is i want to focus on how i can define the problem better so i can find a solution better so if somebody asks me what is my biggest uh, challenge in the covid situation which i want to uh, understand better and solve it i would say i would probably focus on demand uncertainty and following uh, and following with the other other topics as well so with this with this uh, thought process uh, uh, for dr fayan i want to move to the next part of the conversation which is basically Uh, how we can mitigate that risk because i know you are extensive researcher you have written a lot of research papers on this you have a 10 years of experience on research on this topic the pharmaceutical industry which is which is we are right now heavily dependent right so what i would like to i would like to understand is uh, how uh, how you see we should go about and mitigating those risk and uncertainty right now yes uh, thank you um i mean I have been researching supply chain disturbances and mitigation through supply chain configuration for the last 10 years um and I focus mainly on two industries uh, one as you mentioned uh, big pharmas and then uh, more recently on high value manufacturing and both of these industries have been massively impacted by the pandemic um one of the key finding was that um the idea that location no longer matters this mindset is oversimplified and a myth and this was being challenged by a greater recognition of productivity cost of highly dispersed production systems and also the hidden costs of distance so let me explain um the first uh, study that we did on pharmaceutical industry uh, we started it in 2010 uh, when we initiated the project and at that time we saw uh, that european based big farmers was were focusing on outsourcing manufacturing of both uh, core and non core drugs to cheaper locations with uh, similar skill sets like china or india but this study was actually a longitudinal study so we observed the situation uh, for the next 5 years and we saw it changed um, drastically So around 2015 for outpatent and non-core products um these firms were now looking uh, started looking at Asia and Eastern Europe uh, and uh, they were sourcing from where the labor is cheaper it was following a multi-sourcing strategy uh, while outsourcing offshore and the policy was that uh, they usually had two primary suppliers delivering uh, two-thirds of the required capacity so it was evidence that they were evident that they were taking a more cautious or more risk averse approach to outsourcing uh, and offshoring and they wanted to ensure that they had a large enough supplier base for its non core products in the event that supply chain disturbances occur but for the core products they were being sourced or manufactured mainly from the core hubs in western europe so near shoring and one of the reasons was that they wanted to get the product in the market at the right time because it's very important uh for these core products as profit margins are very high for these kind of blockbuster drugs but what was interesting is in 2015 we saw an unexpected phenomena so one of these big farmers began to insource offshore and they were doing it through a process of setting up captives in uh eastern europe and asia uh and they were using this kind of hybrid model and it was aimed at um building the capabilities of its captives by absorbing the knowledge from the best outsourcing partners and um this kind of insourcing offshore has a number of advantages like you if you have captives you can control for cultural and uh, disturbances you can also mitigate for uh infringement of intellectual property right uh, and those kind of risk which you're exposed to with external suppliers you are able to simplify standardize optimize processes across the supply chain and also um what we saw was that the supply chain configuration uh, was like a hub and a spoke model so the eastern european or asian 
um, the spokes were driving the efficiencies while the central Western European hubs were actually driving the innovation and R&D. And after this uh, uh, study, we, uh, in, uh, this paper was published in 2016, we started another project where we looked at European high value manufacturing firms, uh, one in particular which was operating the aerospace industry. And the underlying objective was here to investigate how internally facing product managers perceive firm network and location related supply chain disturbances compared to externally facing supply chain managers. So our hypothesis was that if your managerial perceptions of risk within the same supply chain significantly differ, then risk mitigation becomes more difficult. Whereas if the internal and external facing managers have congruent perceptions of supply chain disturbances, it's easier to implement effective risk mitigation strategies. Now here the findings, what we saw was that um, they could be prejudiced, the, the, uh, the weightage of the disturbances by the functional boundaries of these managers. So for example, internally facing managers, they were perceiving supply chain disturbances to be less than externally facing managers when the strategy was offshoring or outsourcing. Uh, this is kind of expected because uh, you know, uh, externally facing managers, they have an increased ownership of the supply chain. They have a more realistic view of the disturbances, uh, which is associated with dispersed global supply chains. However, what's interesting is that we found both these groups prefer insourcing or nearshoring um, because they feel that these disturbances while outsourcing or offshoring were significantly greater and that offset the benefits of uh, lower cost production. And even though this study was carried out pre-COVID, uh, so in the pre-COVID world, one of the disturbance factors was geopolitical risk. Uh, and we found that this was ranked quite high by the pro by these managers, uh, it was ranked uh, high, um, fourth by the by the supply chain managers. So it was high on their agenda. And in that paper, we highlight that if you have these kind of geopolitical disturbances, like natural disasters or societal disruptions, it could impact all members of a regional supply chain. But little we, did we know at that time, like what an understatement this was, because this pandemic happened at a scale which no one could have imagined. So the question now is, uh, what can firms do? Um, I think in the short term, in the, probably the next three to six months, as, uh, as the lockdown eases and shops open and manufacturing resumes, the ability to respond accurately with cost control will be paramount. And I absolutely agree with you what you said about demand and forecasting, because definitely demand, uh, global demand will be lower, but it will be extremely difficult to forecast. Uh, making planning even more challenging with the higher risk of loss, sales, or markdowns. And in the medium term, like other than forecasting, firms will then need to get their supply chain moving, uh, their supply base is reestablished, and then start getting the right inventory in the right place. And this is easier said than done because as manufacturing for the world's product is more concentrated in China, another point that you mentioned, um, this will lead to challenges in securing critical products Specialized suppliers will, who are in short supply will not be easy to replace. If you have delays to secure parts uh, or if you lose out to competition, then the effect could be catastrophic. Uh, if fewer goods are coming in uh, from the suppliers, the inventory levels will be uh, drying up and buyers will need to find alternate supply sources and they have to go for like a supply grab wherever possible by any means necessary, maybe through integrative negotiation or can, trying to leverage their existing supply relationships. On a, from the supplier's perspective, if you, if you are servicing multiple buyers, then you need to be aware of the real demand uh, versus the bullwhip and try to mitigate the bullwhip effect. And there probably will be logistical challenges as well, uh, because uh, when everyone starts producing, there will be a rush to use the same shipping supplies, which would create bottlenecks. And so firms will need to think about multimodal transport options. However, if, if planes are grounded, then uh, air travel is restricted and securing transportation redundancies will be difficult. So it's essential that firms try to plan now and pre-book rail and air freight capacity. Uh, yes, so I mean, uh, that's what I think is uh, nope. in the industry. 
Pretty good. I think you made you made one point, which was respond with the cost control. And I think I think this is giving because I'm also an you know industry person and sitting in the in the regular industry right now. And I can I can tell you that right. That is uh that would be a tagline right. So you need to be more responsive. You need to find a way to be more agile. Uh, all the things you mentioned in terms of the uh, you know uh, supply basically look into your supply chain design right. So that is a bigger question, right? So is the COVID situation right now is challenging your supply chain design? Because we, it makes you think, right? If you are, uh, and I can see now some uh, questions are coming in. We got 32 participants and I think we, we will answer those those questions in detail. But the, 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 the actual is how was your supply chain design? Was it flexible enough? Was it agile enough? To basically cope with this kind of uh, disruptions, right? So, what I I would like to add a few points in terms of mitigation because the way my my mind works, I'm a very process oriented guy, right? Because in supply chain, I believe everything can can be designed as a process. So there's a input, there's a set of activities, and there's an output. So, uh, given the fact we established this, one of the biggest uh, challenges right now is the demand uncertainty. We don't know the demand variation. So what is the process we should focus on, right? If you have it or if you do not have it. Uh, and there's implication after. So once you understand the demand, then you can think about what is my current capacity look like? What is my inventory look like? What are my supply constraints? And you can work basically backwards into the upstream of the supply chain. So the process which I would like to focus is SNOP. We have sales, inventory, and operations, operations planning. This process it will play a huge part in next three to six, next three to six months of Forever, I know most of the businesses have some level of uh, of sales and operations planning, but right now, if you had uh, if you have the process, then you might want to basically revisit or basically train yourself more to basically see the core elements. Uh, if you go to SM Dujo slash courses, I have recently launched a course on the on the on the SNOP, basically how to run the SNOP, where I've gone through the protocol, the characteristics. So you can effort that course. If you need more information, you can just message me and, and I can message you back. So what I'm doing right now is, is to, because uh, see, what is forecast, right? Forecast, regardless of whatever technique you use, exponential, exponential smoothing, moving average, or set of algorithms, right? It doesn't matter what technique you use. You could use AI, you could use machine learning, but all of those algorithms, mathematical logics, it depends on the historical data, right? It all depends on historical data. So then you apply for whatever mathematical modeling you apply to predict the future, right? The problem right now is the event which has happened right now hasn't happened for the last hundred years. So the historical data does not apply to predict future. So since you do not have any mathematical data to predict future, regardless of the, as I said, logic of technique, how are you going to predict future, right? So this is the, now I'm moving towards the answering the process of that. You know, I was reading the book uh, and there was uh, uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few definitions of the, of the forecast, you know, what, what, as Warren Buffett said, you know, forecast tells you less about uh, the future. Actually, it will tell you more about uh, the, fo the the person or the culture of the organization or tell you more about the person who is forecast, right? Uh, so the point I'm making is this, uh, that you need to use the other attributes. So because historical data does not apply, what do you need to do? Talk to your customers more, talk to your sales guys more, uh, have a bit of more feel of the market, what is happening. Because in certain markets, there is actually uh, a more demand than it was before. Well, let me give you a very obvious example. The, the medical equipment, your, your gloves, your mask, your sanitizers, right? I have just recently found out the Australian cricketer, Shane Vaughan, who used to own the uh, big uh, you know, alcohol company. He has stopped making alcohol and he's basically making sanitizers because there's more money in making sanitizers. So there's not loom, all, all loom, loom and groom, right? So you need to see what are the opportunities. So understand the customers, understand the demand, uh, and see how it goes in e-commerce, for example, e-commerce industry is booming, you know, like the, the textile retailers, because you can't go out, there's more demand coming in. So not everything is bad, right? There are opportunities. So start your SNOP process, talk to your people, understand your demand. So once you know your baseline demand, which would be lower in most cases, in a higher in few cases, then you look into your mining plan, then you look into your capacities. 
And then you see, okay, for this, uh, let's call it projected demand for next three to six months or six to 12 months, uh, what is the, the supply constraint I need to focus on, right? So this would be my suggestion based on the, let's call it the biggest problem. I mean, there's more, more problems like how you take care of the health and safety of your logistics people, uh, how they actually work on social distancing, even, you know, team sitting in the office, if you have a social distance of two meters, I mean, how you talk to each other with the gloves on, you know, there are other smaller elements, but we, because we have a, a limited time, so I'm not going to spend on it. So I'm going to spend time on the, on the biggest problem. So this, uh, this discussion now will lead to the, leads to my last, uh, last, uh, last uh, end of the, our discussion. The third question, which I want to discuss with Dr. Fayan is how the new normal look like. So what are the future changes you see in the supply chain? Um, so from a supply chain perspective, the post COVID world is going to be very different like everything else. Um, as a wise man once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Uh, and the wise man here is uh, the former heavyweight champion, Mike Tyson, yeah. and who, uh, as you know, was sometimes not very wise. But here in this case, he's right, because the key is planning uh, for what you're going to do after you get punched. So that is how good is your counter punch. And after the pandemic, firms will know how well they were actually prepared, how resilient and how agile the supply chains really are. And a positive thing coming out of this is that firms will know how good their simulations, predictions, digital twins, supply chain continuity plans really work. Because it's very difficult to find your bottleneck and, or pinch points if the system isn't being pushed and now it's being pushed to the max. So a key question uh, firms will have to ask is, uh, why do businesses turn out to be less resilient than they had thought? So of course, there's no simple answer and there's no single answer. One problem is that resilience is uh, no one's primary responsibility or their job. So, so put it in another way, there's no chief resilience officer. Another problem is that it's, uh, it's too easy to assume that uh, your untried, untested policies and procedures will prove adequate when events conspire to put them to the test. So the real key to success is to have the right kind of plan to be able to move forward after you get hit. So firms will need to build supply chain resilience, which is the ability of the supply chain to roll with the punches and execute uh, contingencies to protect production and profits when the unexpected occurs. And one of the ways I think the firms will try to do this is through mapping of suppliers. So they will go, uh, what they have to do is map at a very granular, le granular level, not only your own supply chains, but your supplier supply chains. So there will be a lot of focus on creating transparent multi-tier supply chains, establishing a list of critical components, determining the origin of supply, identifying alternative sources, Further, uh, furthermore, like firms must look into the inventory levels in every channel and every location in the network, including spare parts and uh, uh, even after sales stocks. And now we know that supply chain mapping is very resource intensive and it is going to be difficult, yes. But, um, and that's the reason why most companies haven't done it. For example, it took a team of 100 people more than a year to map uh, a Japanese semiconductor manufacturer supply chain uh, into the, into the sub tiers following the earthquake and tsunami in 2011. But I feel that there's no way around it. Companies will discover the value of, of the map uh, and will find that the, the cost to develop it is, um, is less compared to the benefits. So one thing they could do is maybe when they're signing the initial supplier contracts, they could stipulate uh, that suppliers will need to participate annually in a supply chain mapping effort. Uh, also, I think uh, accelerated, um, one thing that is happening now is the digitization of supply chain, or this might be accelerated, that's my prediction. So transformation from traditional linear supply chain models into more digital supply networks where industry 4.0 technology will hopefully allow organizations to become connected um, to their complete supply network and to enable end-to-end -end visibility, which will help with this process. The second thing I think uh, the new normal, uh, what we can expect in the long term is sustainability. Um, 
the crux of my research is on sustainable supply chain management and in particular the social aspect of sustainability which i think will be more in focus so as companies think about resilience post covid keeping people at the core will be the key so not only your internal uh, employees but firms will need to ensure the safety security and livelihoods of suppliers and their workers so uh, as you know that the supply chain is only as strong as as its weakest link and if suppliers go out of business with a cut in orders then vulnerable workers from the bottom of the uh, supply chain will be impacted the most so international buyers or multinational companies will need to work with relevant stakeholders like local industry associations governments international aid agencies to find the money resources and other forms of support so the only way to build your own resilience will be to ensure the sustainability of suppliers by working with them to build joint continuity plans for example which will should explicitly include uh, the workforce uh, another important thing is at this moment buyers must on, honor their contracts otherwise trust and goodwill will unravel in a very short time uh, i'm from bangladesh and the and the major industry there is the garments industry which is the second biggest exporter after china and supports the livelihood of 20 million people directly or indirectly and there's a lot of disturbing news coming out of bangladesh right now that many international buyers are reneging on their payments which is risking the uh, survival of suppliers and then it it also risks wiping out an established supplier base so since the crisis began around 3 billion dollars worth of orders have been cancelled or postponed and the situation is so bad that the garments manufacturer association has actually decided to blacklist some international well known buyers for non payment uh and in another kind of interesting trend that's been observed is that those companies which have previously gone into administration so they have been badly run in the past are the ones most likely not to pay and an interesting trend or turning of the tables could be that presumably weaker developing country suppliers uh, could form consortiums and try to audit the financial strength and record of more powerful western buyers so we could th- see things like uh financial stress testing similar to what we saw in in the 2008 uh financial crisis uh, at both the buyers and the suppliers the third uh point here i would like to make is supply chain reconfiguration and i think you have touched upon it a little bit and because most firms are now kind of thinking of how they can shift away from this reliance on scattered global supply chain towards more uh, localized production and many ceos are asking their supply chain teams to develop additional sources that are completely independent of china even some politicians uh, as you know they they are uh, forcing the companies uh, in in their country to rapidly decouple from china but this will not be easy and only thinking locally is not enough to tackle future challenges so first most countries are highly dependent on china as you said secondly you have to be certain whether your tier 2 suppliers or tier 3 suppliers are not exposed to china as well and that's difficult uh disruption in any tier even for non critical items can shut down production and we have many examples of of these kind of events happening for example with boy um in the post covid world i think we will see a kind of incremental china plus one approach so for example levis reduced its manufacturing in china from 16% in 2017 to between 1 and 2% in 2019 and levi ceo after the pandemic said that this move has shielded the company from the from the coronavirus disruption um also i think companies will try like a balanced approach, approach similar to what um toyota did when they entered the us market so they formed um joint ventures with their existing japanese established suppliers and new us suppliers and they form joint ventures with these uh uh suppliers and uh even in my research i saw the big farmers and high value manufacturing firms uh they they were doing similar things like uh insourcing offshore by setting up captives or building clusters in emerging markets to support their regional hub by partnering with uh, existing suppliers from developed countries and if you migrate an existing supplier to a low cost location this is con- considered a low risk remote outsourcing option but again in reality this won't happen overnight there's equipment technology and know how involved so i don't think there will be any major reshoring but a lot of nearshoring 
So locations uh, near to major markets like Japan, Mexico, Taiwan, or some Eastern European countries tend to benefit from this. At the macro level, I think uh, to expand on your point about the, the pharmaceutical or PPE, um, and also the, the chain one example, like those are really interesting cases because that's something now I'm researching um, and I, I, I've kind of coined the terms continuous supply chains. So what we are noticing is that people who are not uh, producing certain items um, are repurposing their production line to make those items or creating spontaneous supply chains to make ventilators or other things. At a macro level, the nation states will need to do something similar. So you might have similar to army reserves that most countries have, uh, or many countries have, you could have medical reserves where a country can call and train people to respond. Um, or even to use for track and tracing if these kind of pandemics happen in the future. And any kind of, um, for resilience, diversification is the basic principle. In a national setting, if uh, suppose if, if there is a crisis and you go for a localized uh, production or try to localize production a lot and your country gets hit, uh, or in, uh, for example, PPE, masks, or even food, then... Um, you're in trouble. So a diversified global supply chain is still the most resilient solu solution. But you should have critical stockpiling and you should have intelligent buffers or spare capacity in your own domestic supply chain so that you can take over some aspects if the supply chain gets disrupted internationally. Uh, also, you should have parallel supply chains with a percentage of production based uh, locally and the remainder overseas, which then allows companies to ramp up uh, local manufacturing on very short notice when disruptions occur. So um, the final point I would like to make here is that these kind of ideas like redundancy in your supply chain is counterintuitive for most supply chain professionals where the entire careers are built on optimization and efficiency. So in terms of supply chain resilience, redundancy is the efficient solution. Um, Nassim Taleb, the author of the book, The Black Swan, he eloquently argued that an interesting feature of uncertainty is that when it exponentially increases on a certain dimension, it corresponds to an exponential rise in certainty with which some actions should be taken. So to put it in uh, plain English, if you, uh, if you think the uncertainty associated with a plane's structural fitness is very high, then you should be absolutely certain that you should not get on that plane. And as it becomes certain that the world will get more and more uncertain, supply chains will get more and more vulnerable, those bold, previously inconceivable ideas will have to be implemented. So it's less about whether or not change will occur, but about how things will change. So it's like chaos theory, right? When the system is at the precipice of stability and instability, at the moment of collapse is when the innovation occurs. Um, as Machiavelli, uh, he said that never waste the, the opportunity offered by a good crisis. And right after these kind of ca catastrophes or events, uh, it's the right time to sell your upper management on making an investment in risk management and making investment in technologies or having multiple suppliers, reconfiguring your supply chains. And if you don't do it in the next six to uh, six months to a year, the urgency will be gone and the opportunity to make real change will be lost. You know what? I, I think this is, this is one of the best things I hear, right? I mean, uh, you just made my day by saying never miss an opportunity uh, by a good crisis. And I can tell you this, COVID-19 is definitely a good crisis, comes every hundred years. So if there's any opportunity to grasp right now, it is it is this. So I, mean, I think see, you made a lot of lot of very very interesting points, right? So I just pick up six key themes from what you said. You know, the first thing about you mentioned about this connected supply chain, supply chain digitalization. I think it was a very 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 valid point. Then you move towards the sustainability of the supply chain. Again, uh, there is no better time and focus to to look into the sustainable supply chain from all the aspects which based on from the supply chain uh, uh, sub, uh, manufacturing point of view environment point of view whatever point of view i think third third thing you mentioned is about the uh, you know you should honor your contracts i think that is a very important point uh, i think you should have a financial stress test for both 
customers and the suppliers. I think I, I love that idea. And I'm definitely a big fan of the key. You should look into your supply chain configuration because, you know, I teach in the universities in supply chain design where they talk about uh, three basic uh, three basic elements. You know, what is your um, customer segmentation, uh, demand segmentation, or your product segmentation. This is the right time you should look into those customer segmentation, demand segmentation, and your product segmentation, and also the, the the supply segmentation which you talked about. You know, you need to segregate your suppliers and how we're going to measure this. Uh, I think that was that was a very good point, uh, and I like this idea of China plus one. And I think there's one question from Stephanie. I think I'll let her ask later on. Then we should definitely look into do not put the famous saying do not put all eggs in one basket right definitely look into uh, the alternative sources in sources bring back uh, you know the, what people used to do is this you know let's identify your core competency and let's outsource what is we, we are not good at okay that was fine it's still kind of fine but the problem is by you doing that you almost forget what is your core competency Right, so you have to revisit your core competency. If you are manufacturers of, I don't know, electronic circuit board, if you just outsource all your key assembly and you only keep your engineering design or engineering innovation, then what happens is your engineers cannot just go down to the shop floor and come up with more innovative ideas because they, they don't have it. And this is people forget. But if you, the more you outsource, the more you move really away from your product, the less the less your innovation becomes. Apple, maybe Apple is an example, but most people, in my experience, because I work in manufacturing all my life, work with a lot of engineers, and I think I think they, they struggle moving away from the product, right? So I think we've taken enough time, I think 45 minutes talking about us, but I want to make one point in all the goods point uh, Dr. Fayan make. The one thing is definitely going to change, and I believe it will change, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the supply chain digitalization. I wrote a blog of the eight C's of uh, uh, supply chain digitalization, which is the supply chain to be, should be connected. Uh, they should be, you know, uh, have a sense of community and things like that. So you can go to a same doja you can read. Uh, but what was, one thing it has happened to me, and I'm coming from more workforce uh, perspective, right? I'm sitting at home uh, working for last two and a half months. Most of my people are working just last two and a half months and nothing has changed. We are actually doing a similar job. So when I teach in university and talk to my, my staff, I say one thing, unless you work in a warehouse or you're on a transportation where you have to move, uh, uh, move product physically, most of the supply chain functions, you can be a buyer, you can be a planner, you can be supply chain manager, materials manager, uh, analyst, uh, category manager, whatever, right? We essentially manage information. That's what we do, right? To m manage material, we manage information. So the better you are in managing information, the better you become in doing job. Okay. With the advent of technology, I'm talking to about 32 plus people. Dr. Fayan is in the UK. I'm in Dubai. A few people are dialing from USA. And I, I think Bangladesh, China, India, I mean, I think from UK as well. There's quite a few audiences. The point I'm trying to make is this. There will be a time that the finding the right resource and skill set from a remote locations will, will not be a problem. Right. So if I have to hire, for example, a demand planner in Indonesia, right, or in Vietnam, and I can interview that guy uh, or girl, I can I can make him work because I just need somebody to do a good statistical skills, analytical skills, right, who understand uh, uh, how to do analysis and can 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 do demand plan analysis. So the the whole uh, idea of let's call it which was outsourcing into a smaller task, which we call it a gig economy, right? Uh, like your uh, logo design or things like that, that will actually will grow and it will now creep into more professional services. When I say professional services, which could be, you know, if you want to hire somebody who is a procurement expert and want to do your contract, you, you can go and hire, you can have a Zoom chat and you can basically hack, you can hire them as pay as you go. For example, if somebody looking for, a, let's call it a consultation from Dr. Fayan, you just reach him out. He doesn't have to know your business. You can talk to him. You can talk to me and we can provide our uh, advisory services, you know, which could be supply chain design, SNOB, whatever. The point is this trend will grow. I'm 100% I'm sure about it, right? Maybe not on the individual label, but maybe a small company specialized services. So once the specialized services will grow, it will grow. 
I've done a, uh, a project recently there where all the supply planning, which was in most of the European ex uh, expensive plants, we've taken out of all Germany, UK, France, blah, 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 and we moved into Central Europe, right? Once we moved to Central Europe, it was easier, it was clearly cheaper, it was better as well. Okay, so so that I think it, this 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 trend of let's call it uh, most uh, most of the supply chain functions which can be centralized will move can be done from anywhere, right? So that was a point I was making. So at this point, what I will do is I think we got 15, 20 minutes maximum. We will open for questions. So I'm gonna unmute you all. So I will actually ask Stephanie Schrader if you can uh, if you can ask your question. Hi Stephanie, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Go ahead, Stephanie. So I actually had two questions. Um, so they they kind of tie into the same thing. We we have a little niche market. We're in um, several a complicated market, but fairly small. We're in several different businesses. We cater to sports, and um, we do a lot of our manufacturing over in Taiwan and in China. So a couple questions that I've had is in the past. Why haven't, uh, as China is has grown and is as big, and I'll put my video on here so I can see me talking to you guys, but yeah. as China has grown and they're as big as they are, why haven't other countries like the United States, why haven't we moved to countries like India or other low-cost countries in, um, and I'm talking about a medium-sized company, not a big Nike who is in many countries, but a, con a company like mine, uh, you know, an $85 million company, should we be looking at countries like India? Is um, is that a good place to start for other, what I would consider low cost countries that maybe may provide a little bit more stability? And then also um, just touch on Hong Kong. So we have warehouse in Hong Kong. We have a huge good office in Hong Kong that um, work on our behalf. But with all the geopolitical things, I've kind of stepped back and thought, okay, we have this warehouse in Hong Kong, we have an office in Hong Kong, we manufacture our main products in China and Taiwan, all of that kind of under the cloud of China. So should we be looking for other warehouses? Speaking of Yeah, so what I'll, let me answer this first and I'll, I'll let uh, Fayan put into this. So as you said, there are related questions. The first is, I think you're looking for some idea on the on the other sources, yes? Uh, yes. I, I, I don't use the word low cost because it's just, I don't like it in terms of the branding. I use the word best cost. I think the best cost is the better word, right? Okay. Uh, so we, we so I, I think I use this, I think that is a better word to use uh, that, okay, we use best cost countries, okay? So from the best cost countries, I see the, I'll actually recommend it, three regions or of that. So one is like, you should look into your Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, especially Vietnam. So what Google has actually done is, and they have seen it coming, they got a lot of data, AI into that. They have moved all their, actually all their core product, which basically Google Home, you know, the phone they make, Pixar, et cetera. They, they've all moved to Vietnam. The beauty of Vietnam is they got 98% literacy rate. They have a very high internet access. They have, uh, I think Pakistan is the third biggest in terms of the young age. And I think they are the either first or the second, I don't remember. They have a 60% young people. So young, educated people with the good access to, uh, I think, comparatively low cost, uh, let's call it workforce, educated people, you can find it. So Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia comes on one of those. Uh, one of those. The logistics network is there right so you can access it the lead time is better you can look into definitely india i think the political situation of pakistan and bangladesh are getting better they are in i think the same boat as 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 Fayan mentioned this they have a lot of young people coming in i think there's the population right now 60 people uh 60 percent of the of the population are less than 30 years of age they have a younger population educated population a lot of internet access so you can look into that and then you move to the more like african countries you know, you know like your kenya's your nigeria your south africa there's a huge amount of investment happening in south africa right uh, you should and you should look into this so recently i've been a part of the project i can't tell you detail we are actually looking into morocco as one of the key manufacturing location for the especially for to supply for the european because they are just on the south right they're very near to spain 
right? So Morocco, the king has done what he has done is he has he has created a specialized uh, tax-free manufacturing hub. So you open a plant and you don't pay tax for 10 years, and he will put his money to develop trend. So there's a there's a bit of supply chain issue because the first in first day supply is not there, but is an option, right? Then I move to Eastern Europe, and that's the part which I'm actually very keen. If you are into let's call it into Europe, because I live most of my life in Europe. And so like your Ukraine, your basically Romania, Czech Republic, uh, low cost countries. I have actually done the study from the uh, door to door uh, cost point of view. Uh, I, again, I'll be very specific. I'm talking more electrical products and stuff, automotive products. The labor cost per hour is less in Romania and Czech Republic than in China. So your door-to-door -door lending cost is, is lower. And because they're in Europe, there's a shorter lead time and you can supply better. So the point I'm making is I'm not giving you uh, an answer of your question exactly. I'm giving you ideas with a bit of study. We, we can do that. So Payan, we want to add something. I mean, um, I think you've covered it uh, in great detail. But the thing is, uh, the only thing maybe I can add is in my own research, um, and I like this idea about the best, uh, the best cost, pro, uh, best cost. Yeah, I mean, we have been actually trying to uh, push this idea that you shouldn't go to the to the lowest cost producer. And we said, okay, you need to look at supply chain disturbances internally, externally, and also location kind of supply chain disturbances. So, for example, in 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 my papers, we have. Um, identify things like hidden costs of distant operations, infrastructure availability, labor force availability, uh, disparity in national cultures, uh, government regulation and policy, geopolitical factors, and all these other kind of environmental risks that come with choosing a certain location. Now, what firms do is they probably look at cost and quality, but uh, how many firms while making their procurement decision consider these other things? And maybe 20 years ago, it wasn't, the situation wasn't like this. Um, uh, you know, the China was, um, you know, coming up. There was huge amount of options available, low cost suppliers were bidding against each other and, and, and Western kind of buyers tried to play them against each other and try to get the best um, value or cost out of it. But, now it's they are being affected even in terms of wages like what you mentioned um i mean vietnam has uh, comparatively low wages um uh, china in 20 years ago the wages w uh, in the us was about 20 times more than chinese wages but now it's probably only three four times more so some if a company has made a decision to outsource to from china uh, china 20 years ago, they need to reconsider it now. And they need to think about other locations and other options. And I think you gave some very good examples of uh, uh, Asian locations or African. So it's really, it depends how, I mean, it also depends where your major markets are. So you would uh, want to be closer to your major markets as well. So if you're kind of uh, looking into Europe, then you would probably go for Eastern yeah. European one, or you might divide it into uh, if you I don't know what kind of manufacturing you do, but if it is uh, like places like Morocco might be good for the lower end kind of uh, production, but with more high tech stuff, you can go to other places uh, yeah. like Malaysia, yeah. or, or which have a more established supplier base. And it's also important is something now that I'm um, trying to re uh, come up with is a model which says, okay, if you want to move to another country, then you choose a first year supplier, but does that supplier then have an established supply base for that product, which is also protected or which is kind of... Um, yeah, Fayan, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you actually. Uh, but the reason I'm going to interrupt you because there's a very relevant question from Jose Antonio yeah. on this. So actually, I think mm -hmm. uh, if Jose asks you a question, I think you can answer two questions in one time. Sorry for sure, that. Yeah. Jose. Moment. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, Jose. Do you mind uh, asking your question? I think it's, it's relevant to the discussion Fayan was having with uh, Stephanie. Oh, thank you so much. I never meant to interrupt uh, Fayan. Uh, I think Stephanie raised right. interesting issues and you guys are 
amazing sharing all your knowledge. I have made three questions. I hope the last one is that the one you are referring to. Yep. Because I believe you both agree in suggesting, Stephanie, and all of us, that under the circumstances, we should look to other potential sources, which is, of course, a good strategy in, in principle. But I am asking you guys uh, how these can be made effectively, but also in a safe way. I mean, safe uh, from the perspective of uh, performance, uh, reliability, uh, you know, sustainability of the new arm of the supply chain being adjusted this way. I'm trying just to explain my question. Okay, Payan, please continue. Well, I mean, uh, that's a very interesting question. And I mean, we could probably go on <laughs> half an hour on this. But the, the thing is, I mean, that's very, very relevant because even if you see, uh, so now I'm based in the UK, the UK government, when they started procuring for PPEs um, or in the US, uh, we have heard report that Trump uh, kind of uh, fast track uh, one of those um, uh, a company to uh, procure uh, PPE via a tweet. So this guy just tweeted to Trump and Trump said, yeah, go ahead. And then the, uh, the things weren't delivered. In the UK, uh, the government uh, commissioned uh, someone to buy stuff from Turkey. And then, you know, there was this huge fiasco when uh, it was saying that, okay, this million uh, PPE will arrive on this day. And then they were backtracking and so on. So in a short time to judge if the supplier is good enough. It's very, very tricky. Um, and so obviously you have to do your due diligence. You have to see uh, if, if those suppliers, have, who, those, who their customers were, how many kind of successful orders they have completed. Um, go and audit those suppliers in terms of, you mentioned sustainability, in terms of the social standard, the environmental standard. So it's going to be very, it, it's not going to be an easy like one kind of one fixed solution is going to be difficult and you have to go through all the different steps of supplier selection. Um, if you want to add something. No, no, no. I think um, I don't want to, as, I, as you said, it's a longer discussion, uh, but I want to make sure we, I want to give other people, other, uh, you know, other people opportunity to, to ask the questions. Right. So I think one of the questions is come from Chris, uh, Chris Smith. I'm not sure he's still around because I think he's going in and out. Chris, can you hear us? Hi. Yeah, I was just talking about supply chain uh, risk mitigation strategies, really, given COVID, um, you know, how they're going to change. Um, I, obviously, I heard Fahim talk about the uh, China Plus One model, but if there are any others that uh, he could share with us, that'd be great. Thanks. Right. So I think uh, my view is I think uh, Fahim has already covered his few of the research points, what he said about, I think, understanding the difference between the risk and alternative right and then you say what are the options uh, available to see okay what are your what, is, what what are your key problem problem items right now i mean uh, to understand what you want to mitigate mitigate you need to understand what specific problem we are talking right so uh, i mentioned example of the uh, demand uncertainty so and how one, one want to cater it is by basically following snop process right so Ayan, you want to add a few 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 words there um, so the question was, how do you mitigate? Um, mitigate. So, uh, what mit what mitigation strategy we can expect in future, given mm -hmm. our experiences in this pandemic? I think you covered uh, this question when you are basically answering the second second question. So maybe just summarize few points again. Yeah, I mean, um. In terms of mitigation, it's it's yeah, it's just kind of same thing. I think uh, kind of to summarize, you have to look at, you have to first identify your disturbances in your supply chain, uh, and then you have to rank them. You have to weight them somehow, weigh them, and then you have to prioritize them and see okay which ones you want to tackle. And it's also about time. It's also about resources. So. Uh, currently, it might be that you need to find an alternate source of supply. So then you spend most of your time trying to mitigate that risk or trying to find multiple supply sources. So 
it, like you said, it depends on the problem. So exactly what is the problem? What is the industry uh, and so on? But in, 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 in a kind of high level um, answer, I think it's vitally important to um, identify the different types of risk. It's important to map your supply chain, you know, maybe use digital twins and so on and see how, if things change, if one supplier goes down, how, how does it affect the entire system? And just try to build resilience into your supply chain as much as possible. And it's yeah. not going to be easy. It's not going to be a very short term thing. It's going to be painful. I think it's, it's, it's a longer term project. Yeah, it depends yeah. on a lot of things. It depends on resources. It depends on your capabilities. It depends on uh, even uh, your funding. So you know, a lot of small and medium enterprises won't have the necessary funding to adopt some of these uh, industry 4.0 tech, which other big companies might be able to adopt. So it depends yeah. on a lot of things actually. So no, great answer. Thanks for summary. I will. Uh, I need to finish in the next seven minutes because I have uh, one more. Uh, webinar is actually 5.15. So I'll take two questions, right? And uh, yeah, Azi, you're there? Azi? Yes, good morning, doctor. How are you? Yeah, Azi, Azi, good friend. He's one of my, one of my, let's call it top followers, right? So Azi, good to have you again, mate. Good, good. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good, mate. So yeah, fire away. What's your question? I hope you're doing well. You look good. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, uh, uh, earlier you, uh, you mentioned that um, that you need to talk to um, the stakeholders or your stakeholders such as your sales department or your marketing department, how to like forecast and whatsoever. But the thing is that, you know, the discussion is there, but you need to ask the correct questions. To get the right answers, um, are there any advices? What type of questions need to be asked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now lovely. Actually, uh, so as I said, uh, if you know the problem, problem is half solved, right? And the and the uh, the uh, actually the intelligence is not in the answer. I think the intelligence is in the question, right? Uh, so uh, so. I, I, your picture is frozen. I'm not sure you can hear me, uh, but the answer I would give is is this. Uh, so what I'm doing right now, I'm making uh, a special uh, focus groups, right? And I'm making because the thing is, each country right now. Let's think, uh, think this through. Okay, most of the countries have been affected, yes, but each country have a different level of the impact. So for example. The Saudi Arabia is in lockdown today. UAE is not. UAE is actually opening. They are like one and a half hour drive away, if you think about it, right? So the situation is uh, different. Uh, there could be a junior political reason, whatever reason, I, I don't know. New Zealand right now have a zero COVID, right? Uh, for example, European countries is opening. Italy is looking to bring back the, the, the for example, the, uh, the tourism and things like that, right? There is a uh, cricket is starting from UK in, in July, West Indies traveling. But the point I'm trying to make is this, you need to make a focus group. So wh whatever product you are making, whatever your end market are in that focus group, you have to have a localized collection of knowledge, right? Because as I said, some countries are impacted more than the others. And then from that onward, you have to make the, the strategy. So if you are supplying to a, a country, Again, looking into the news, because listening to the news is important. I know it's stressful, but it's still important, right? So gather your market information, see what's happening, and then ask the question. So, for example, Saudi for me is a big market. I know the situation is not bad because of I'm hearing the news. So I'm not going to ask that difficult question to my sales guys in Saudi because I, I have a sympathy with them, right? So, however, oh. on, yeah, on the other hand, if I'm, I'm talking to a country, let's call it Egypt, Egypt is not a bad situation. You know, the rate is low. They are one of the, let's call it a more moving parts. The lockdown is very eased out. Uh, they are open for holidays, travel. There is a level of normality. So if, 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 if my people in, for example, Egypt is saying, oh, we got a big problem. And then I'm going to ask, myself, okay, but you know, talk to me. Why are you saying what you're saying, right? So what are the market dynamics? What is the inventory situation with your end customers? What does the demand look like, right? And I will give them the, the some kind of statistical backing some news, you know, some sort of link saying what I'm hearing actually is the situation is it's Egypt is not bad. So 
tell me why you think you on you cannot give me forecast you know i'm just giving you example right gotcha. uh, again so do your homework right as i said in my snop course which you have joined uh, as well preparation is the key right Pre so prepare for your questions do your study ask intelligence questions i can assure you you will get intelligence answers gotcha. okay thank you right so folks i would as i said i need to, i'm going to start wrapping up i apologize i have not picked up all the questions we have 32 participants and more today i was expecting around around the same number ish uh, so thank you very much for joining uh, i think this is a very interesting topic uh, fayan it's been pleasure to have you i think we will have fayan in more more i think i will try to interact with him more because what i actually i learned a lot from you today you sit in the university you have a lot of research and i'm sure the the following followers of my you know esteemed and myself will benefit right so thank you very much for joining us really really good experience i will i'm recording this and i will make it available into the YouTube ch uh, channel of STM Dujo. What I will request uh, our colleagues who have joined today uh, and ask questions and sign up, that once I share this video, I think I will send into newsletter either this week or a week after. Please share further and tell more people so they can, they, they can benefit. It's like a karma, so the more we share, the better, right? So, uh, Fayan, thank you for joining. It's been a pleasure to have you. Any final words from you? Well, thank you for having me, uh, Dr. Mundas. I think I really also enjoyed the experience. Um, and always, it's it's a, it's a pleasure to interact with you. I also learn a lot, uh, especially from your practical experience. And you wear two hats, so you have the PhD, and also you actually walk the walk. So uh, it's always very interesting to uh, talk to you about supply chain issues, uh, you know, which is uh, what I do. So I think... Uh, I will be happy to come in the future if there's other opportunities. Definitely. We will definitely organize one. So thank you guys, folks. I, I wish you all a very good uh, weekend. Stay safe. Look after yourself. Take care. Bye. So if you like this video, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and leave your comments below.